My father used to say to me, why be difficult when you can be impossible? And for me, making trouble was necessary to survive. We're really delighted this afternoon to have Drew Faust back here at Goldman Sachs. You all know that she served as the president of Harvard University from 2007 to 2018. Currently, she's the Arthur Kingsley Porter University professor. She was the founding dean of the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Before Radcliffe, she was the Annenberg Professor of History at the University of Pennsylvania. But most importantly, most importantly, she served on our board of directors from 2018 to 2020. Most importantly. Not necessarily most importantly, but most importantly <laughs> to us. But it really is nice to have you back in the building and back here. You're the author of several books, the most recent of which we'll discuss today, which is called Necessary Trouble, Growing Up at Mid-Century, a memoir of her high school and college years during which she not only traveled behind the Iron Curtain at the height of the Cold War, but also participated in the Selma to Montgomery March in 1965. And so you've got a very, very fascinating perspective on that chapter in our history. So let's first start by welcoming Drew Gilpin. Thank you so much. So let's get right into it. And it's always good to start at the beginning of a book. And I'll just start with the title. <laughs> okay, you say that in the book that you asked for permission from a civil rights icon to use a famous phrase of his. Can you tell us who it was? why you decided to use his words, and what you were trying to capture as you framed this book. So the book is called Necessary Trouble, and for many of you that may resonate, good trouble, necessary trouble. Words of John Lewis, who was a hero to me from the time I was in college and saw him have his head beaten in on the bridge, marching from Selma to Montgomery. I got to know him a bit while I was Harvard president, and as I was writing the book, I came to think this is, would be a perfect title. I was searching for a title. And I thought it would be a perfect title because the book's about growing up in Virginia in the 1950s and 60s in a segregated society where my mother told me that it was a man's world and the sooner I figured that out, the better off I'd be. And so I was in open revolt from the time I was very small as she tried to make me into a lady and a good Southern lady and uh, also to uh, introduce me to the segregated ways of the society that she and all my relatives and everybody around me in my white world took for granted. And my father used to say to me, why be difficult when you can be impossible? And for me, making trouble was necessary to survive, to resist what I saw as the very unhappy lives of my mother and grandmother, and to find a path that I could follow with satisfaction and joy in my life. So when I was finishing my term as Harvard president, John Lewis in 2018, skipping forward rapidly here, in 2018, John Lewis gave the talk at my final commencement as a uh, gesture of friendship because we'd collaborated on various things during my presidency. And he got up as he began his remarks and turned to me and said, thank you for making necessary trouble. And I was so honored to have been addressed in that way by him that the words came to me as a possible title. But it seemed presumptuous of me to take those words somehow and I was worried about it. So just two months before he died, I had a phone call with him and I said, would it be okay if I called my book Necessary Trouble? Well, John Lewis was one of the most gracious, generous human beings who ever lived. And he said, of course, of course, I would be honored if you'd call your book that. So the book is called that. Uh, I think in one way to honor him is an homage to him in a sense, but his life is what honors him. Far be it from me to say I could honor John Lewis anything beyond what his life honored him as. But, yeah. but I was very grateful to be able to borrow these words. Can I touch on your mom, you know, since you raised it? And I know, you know, you begin the book with what has to be for any person a devastating moment in your life at 19 years old, the death of your mother. And you later said that, quote, I'm sure she loved her children, but I'm not sure she liked or enjoyed us. Talk a little bit more, I mean, you hinted at this, but talk a little bit more about your relationship with your mother and the impact it had on you. The book begins with a description of her death, which came 
in the eyes of all of us children, we thought at least very suddenly on Christmas Eve in 1966 when I was a junior in, in college. And I just had a huge fight with her the week before demanding that I be allowed to do something that she thought I was not proper. I wanted to go visit a boyfriend in Connecticut before I came home from college. She said under only, only under certain circumstances, if she heard from his parents that they were going to be there to chaperone us. I said, what century is this? You know, and I just <laughs> threw this fit and went anyway. So I come home and my mother's unwell and soon is taken to the hospital, has surgery and dies. And it was shocking and horrifying, but as I thought about it, and particularly looking back as I, as I wrote the book, my mother was extraordinarily thin. She was about five feet nine and weighed about 90 pounds. And I think in retrospect, she was an adult anorexic, and I think it was a part and parcel of her unhappiness and her deep dissatisfaction with the constraints on her life, which gave her in her social milieu and the expectations around her no choice but to devote her life to children and husband. And in my interpretation of it, she kind of erased her own self until literally physically she erased herself. And so I fought with her from the time I was a tiny child about wearing little lace clothes and doing girl things and not being allowed to do the things my brothers could do. And so we were always at loggerheads. She had very strong ideas and she asserted them, but it was very difficult. I don't think we ever, I, I know we didn't, we never resolved that conflict. Did and you have any sisters or were you the only? I'm only girl, three brothers. Three brothers. So that dynamic at that point in time also was, was very different. Yes. It and was definitely when my, a, a double standard. For sure. Yeah. And when my youngest brother was born, he's eight years younger than I am. I was eight years old. So I go to the phone and to pick up the phone and someone's on the phone saying, your mother just had a baby. And I wait with bated breath. I was so relieved it was a boy <laughs> because I thought if it's a girl, I have a lifetime of negative comparisons to look for because I was so at odds with what I was supposed to be. And I thought if I had this ideal little sister, it's going to be miserable. I figured that out at eight. So that I think is an <laughs> illustration of the collision course we were Attention. on. Attention. I want to go back because you were talking about, and you highlighted that you grew up in a segregated society, but you said you didn't really appreciate the level of inequity until you had an epiphany in 1957. Talk a little bit about that. You wrote a letter to someone very important. Who was it? What did the letter mean to you? Talk us through that. It, I was driving home from, being driven home from school in 1957 by an African-American man who worked for my family, who drove us children around and did various things around the household. And I lived on a big farm. He would help out with some of the, the issues on the farm. And I heard on the radio conversation about integration of schools. And this was not long after Brown v. Board had mandated that schools be integrated. And Virginia's white establishment decided that they would advocate for closing the schools rather than integrating them, just eliminating public education, which they did in several counties until courts made them open them again. So I was hearing all this debate about this surrounding the governor's elections in the aftermath of the implementation of this program called Massive Resistance. And I had this, this realization, I was nine years old, that my school was white on purpose. It wasn't by accident that this was a law of the state that my school be all white. And having for uh, an, however many years, set, uh, nine years, said to myself, it's not fair, it's not fair, as I was told to do or not do things that my brothers were not required to do or not do, I suddenly realized this was really not fair. This was much more unfair than the, the petty issues that I'd been dealing with as a girl in a family of, of, of three brothers. And so I said to the um, African-American man who was driving, is this true? And he said, nothing. And I said, if I painted my face black, I couldn't go to my school tomorrow? He said, nothing. And that was revealing in itself. And so I went home and I sat down and I wrote an irate letter to President Eisenhower demanding that he integrate the schools, 
it's reproduced on the first page of my book. You can see the little letter. <laughs> I, I told myself my whole life that I'd written this thing. And about year 2000, I decided if I wrote this letter, it's probably in the National Archives. I'm a historian. I should have figured that out sooner. <laughs> so I wrote to the National Archives and they found the letter, found the letter. in That's the Eisenhower thing. Library yeah. in Kansas. Yeah. So I was able to reunite myself with this very bossy letter from a nine-year-old girl to the president about integrating the schools and how important it was. You talked about other inequities of the society you grew up in. You mentioned a report card you got in second grade. The headmaster of your school was ambivalent about your performance. I find that shocking based on what I know about your academic credentials and your engagement, you know, certainly on our board. But this headmaster had a surprising piece of advice. Well, he was ambivalent because I was such a good student, David. Oh, okay. Um, I was doing really well in school, and the preceding summer, I'd read some enormous number of books. I can't remember what. And we were supposed to, at the end of the summer, list all the books we'd read. So I came in with this... <laughs> tome of, of uh, titles that I'd read. And so he said on my report card at the end of the second grade year, I should read fewer books the coming summer, that enough is enough. And I just, when I found this report card as I was going through accumulated family mess in order to write, to write yeah. this book, I read it and I just thought, he wouldn't have said that to a little boy. You know, this was a girl who was kind of going off the rails, being too smart and too good a student and devoting herself too much to, to her intellectual pursuits. And so it was, it was a shock to me to read it and to think that was the kind of world that yeah. the 1950s represented. Yeah. I mean, the difference is, it's, it's really, I mean, I don't think about the 1950s as being that long ago. You know, That's because you're only 62. I know, but it's still, <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was born in 1962, but still, it is interesting because it, it, it obviously, there's been enormous change, but it's not that long ago. Well, you know, the, that's really the reason I wanted to write this book, yeah. because it was another world in so many ways that I think so many of you would not recognize. And I, I wanted to make sure that young people knew how different it was and how much things have changed. I think there yep. can be a certain despair. Nothing's ever changed. A lot has a lot changed, changed since I was a kid. Yeah. You know, when you were 13, you enrolled in Concord Academy, which was an all guards boarding school. And you mentioned a moment when the headmistress, one Elizabeth Hall, took you aside and said something that had, quote, an enormous impact on you. Who was she? Why did she have such a big impact? So Mrs. Hall was a woman who was just undaunted by almost anything. And she drove a tractor around the school in order to build a skating rink. And she climbed up on, a la on ladders and fixed things. And she dismantled an old meeting house in New Hampshire and brought it board by board down and reassembled, not all by herself, but she was full participant in all of this, reassembled it as a chapel on the Concord Academy campus. Uh, she got up and gave inspiring speeches. It just seemed she could do anything. And she ran the school. And the school was kind of a world of women. It was a girls' school then. And I, it, I saw such a contrast with the women of my mother's social circle, the parents of my um, elementary school friends. This was a woman who could do anything and proceeded to try to do everything. And so it represented for me a different kind of model of what a woman could be. Yeah. And getting out of Virginia and going to New England, I think, was part of that. Who she was was just, she was unto herself, but she was inspiring. And she took me aside one night and said, I can't remember what I'd done that hadn't pleased her. I mean, I hadn't done anything terrible, but mm -hmm. she just thought I could do more, I could do better. And she gave me a pep talk. And I thought, wow, she noticed me. and. She's so accomplished. Maybe I could be accomplished too. And it had a, it had a big impact. It had a big impact. Well, in the summer of 63, you did something that I think at the time must have been really extraordinary. You went to Western East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, in a Ford microbus with six other high school students. And I assume it says two leaders, but I assume they were two adults. Well, one was a college student and one okay. was an so adult. A, a, a micro adult. <laughs> a micro adult. But um, why did you take this trip? What prompted you to take this trip? And, and, Give us some of your impressions of what it was like to be behind the Iron Curtain, you know, in 1963. I was, pre I think I was pressed to do this um, by the experience of the fall of 1962, which was the Cuban Missile Crisis. Yeah. 
and sitting on an empty classroom one evening at Concord Academy with six or seven of my friends talking about how the world was going to end and what would we most regret having missed when the world ended the next day or in a couple of days. I came across this flyer that um, just in a pile of summer opportunities that described a Quaker oriented, a Quaker affiliated trip to Eastern Europe that was meant to put students in contact with students on the other side of the Iron Curtain in service of, you know, international peace, hands across the Iron Curtain. And I decided I really wanted to go. And this trip was eye-opening in so many dimensions. One of them was, it was really the first time of the nine people in this little minibus, the two um, adults and the, the others, um, three were African-American. And I had never been in such close proximity in an uh, environment of equality and community with African-Americans. That even Concord Academy was largely segregated, even though it was in New England in, in the early 60s. And so this was transformational for me. Uh, and then the experience of being in Eastern Europe was as well. We went across the, went through Checkpoint Charlie, through the wall. Um, we wondered as we went, why are we doing this? All Everybody in East Germany seems to want to get out. We seem to want to get in. We had this little moment of, of anxiety as we went through the wall. Uh, and we saw a society that was highly repressive. We had a minder who followed us everywhere and tried to to make sure that we didn't meet with people illegitimately or see anything we weren't supposed to see. But we did see things we weren't supposed to see because one of these adults was a person who had emigrated from Germany at the time of World War II. He was Jewish, he'd left Germany, but he knew many people who lived in East Germany. And so we'd have these connections and, and interactions with unapproved um, East Germans. Our minder lost his job after we left oh, wow. because he had permitted this to happen. But he was constantly trying to represent the philosophy of East Germany to us and defend East Germany. And I got a real, because he was so adamant, I think I got real insight into the logic that kept that society glued together as long as it was. It wasn't ex ex exclusively force. And I mean, there was a lot of force. Mm -hmm. And we saw pe places where people had been shot. We had young people come up to us and say, would you help me escape? And we never knew whether that was legitimate or whether they were trying to entrap us. Mm -hmm. uh, there were no um, African-Americans in East Germany and people would come up to the African-Americans in our group and try to touch them and touch their hair and ask them things like, will your skin color wash off? So it was like going to a completely different world in, in every possible way. Uh, Czechoslovakia and Yugoslavia were less oppressive, a bit more open, Yugoslavia being the most open of the three. Right. And a lot of spirited, we went to a youth camp for a time where young Yugoslavians were helping build roads to make bring the country up to a standard of living that was more competitive. And you got more of a sense of buy-in to the Yugoslavian experiment. But of course, every country that I've just mentioned no longer exists. Yeah. Yeah. Yugoslavia splintered in a terrifying way and a tragic way uh, with all the death of, in the um, Balkan Wars. Czechoslovakia is of course Czech and Slovakia and East Germany is now reunited. So those countries were all unstable in ways that we've only seen um, play themselves out in the decades that followed. Yeah. So the next summer you chose to do something very different. And I assume in some way there was some impact on this experience that set you on the next experience, you joined a group of 15 high school and college students, three adult leaders to travel the sites in the South to learn more about the cause of civil rights, you know, in the South. So this came out, the person who'd organized this Eastern Europe trip contacted me a couple months after we got back and he said, you know, I don't know why I'm taking everyone to Eastern Europe. We have so many things going on in our own country that are so divisive and so troubling. I want to take a group of students down to the South next summer and see if we can have conversations across lines of difference in the South. Well, that was the original impetus. And we did meet with a number of white segregationists. However, we were a mixed group. 
in, um, racially, and we were staying with members of the black community who were active in civil rights. I remember in the one place we were was Orangeburg, South Carolina, and the family I stayed with there, the nine-year-old had been arrested 12 times for protesting um, and doing civil rights activities. So we more or less just joined in with the black families and, and um, people that we were staying with and that we um, met through these Quaker ties. And so it was a summer that was a pretty dramatic one in the South. It was this Freedom Summer in Mississippi. It was right after the Civil Rights Act was passed. And so we spent a lot of our energy testing the implementation of the Civil Rights Act that said you cannot have, you cannot deny service to black people in public accommodations, which had been the case beforehand. So we would go to the a and root beer in a mixed group and see if we would be served and um, just generally try to kind of test the limits of the enforcement of the Civil Rights Act. And this was all shortly before the Civil Rights March from Selma to Montgomery, which you decided you had to join. And it sounds like you had a fascinating experience around that. One thing you highlighted with the National Guardsmen. So I, after the summer that I just described, I went off to college and in the spring of my freshman year, I saw John Lewis have his head bashed in on national television and in this horrifying way that made me think, if this goes on in my country, I have to do something about this. I can't live with myself. I think partly it was, I had known, met so many young people the previous summer who themselves had been activists and who might well have had their heads bashed in on television. It was, I felt very proximate to what was happening because of my previous summer's um, experience. And so I cut my midterms and said to my boyfriend, come on, we're going to Selma. And so we got in, we borrowed a car and drove from Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania to Selma. The incident David was asking about, we were driving down to Selma and it was a march, the John Lewis head bashing march happened. And then this was a subsequent march that was meant to um, say, we're going to get there anyway, even though the first march had been turned turned back. As we were driving south, we heard that um, President John Lyndon Johnson was going to call out the National Guard this time to protect the marchers so there wouldn't be another bloodbath. And we felt this huge sense of relief. We were about in South Carolina at that point thinking, OK, this isn't going to be as, as frightening as we had anticipated. And we got to Selma and parked our car to rush over to the meeting point for the starting of the march. And I was walking along the sidewalk in Selma and these two National Guardsmen came towards me and I sort of thought, oh good, these are the people who are taking care of us. And as they were walking by me, one just reached out and slammed me in the breast and just kept walking. And I was so shocked. I mean, I wasn't badly hurt or anything, but I was just knocked the air out of me. And I, I, I just thought, oh yeah. Alabama comes first and national is second, and they, they may be nationalized, but they're, they're gonna have their resentments nevertheless. And this National Guardsman decided to take his resentment out on me. I was clearly not from Selma. I was one of those outside agitators, and he yeah, was not happy about it. He was not that. happy about it. Shortly after that, you attended your first anti-war rally in Washington, D.C in the mid 60s, and you've certainly attended a bunch of anti-war rallies, and it's been something that over the next you know, five years, you became a significant participant in these anti-war protests. Talk a little bit about how you thought about that, why it was so important to you, and how your impression of it changed kind of through the journey mm. of the rest of that decade. I think two aspects of the, the situation with the Vietnam War were very moving to me. One was the notion that had animated me in so many ways through, through my whole life, which it isn't fair, it isn't just this is a war that's wreaking havoc on a population that doesn't deserve to be treated this way. So there was the gesture of, of concern for what we were doing in Vietnam and to Vietnam. Also, the draft was a very real presence in the lives of anybody who was in college in those that years. Time, yeah. Bryn Mawr and Haverford College were um, coordinate colleges at that point. So I knew many Haverford students. All the Haverford students I knew actually were struggling with what they were going to do about the draft. Were they going to go to Canada? Were they going to serve in the military? Were they going to go to jail? Were, were they there still become... educational deferments when you started at college? Or 
There were, so, but yeah. when they graduated, yeah, when they graduated, yeah, they had yeah. to go. Yeah. So unless they did certain um, particular mm -hmm. lines of study, you could be a doctor under something called the Berry Plan, mm -hmm. postpone your service, but then you had to do your service later. Mm -hmm. If you went to divinity school, you could get out of it for a certain period of time. But overwhelmingly, people had to go. And so the late night conversation topic was, what are we going to do about the draft? And it mobilized students who felt that the war had come home, in a sense. It involved their lives in a very direct way. Yeah. And so the unfairness of why should I go die in Vietnam motivated a lot of anti-war protesters. Yeah. So I went to many, many, many anti-war protests in Washington and in, in Philadelphia. But I was always a peaceful protester. And when the anti-war movement began to splinter and the more violent part of it emerged, I did not join that part. And I had many college friends, or some college friends at least, who did. And one very good friend of mine joined the, the violent part of the movement and then disappeared into the weather underground for a number of years. And that was the way the 60s were. There were a lot of people who kind of tipped over the edge and in one way or another into violence, into drug use, into various other dimensions of the culture change that yeah. was overwhelming that particular college generation. So yeah. I always remained a peaceful protester, a frustrated peaceful protester, but perhaps the Quaker links of my earlier involvement had an influence as well. Yeah, it was an interesting period. And I want to get to a little later in the decade of 1968, for example, which was a really you know, interesting year. If you think about Johnson not running for re-election, Martin Luther King being assassinated, you know, Robert Kennedy, you know, shortly after, I mean, it was, you know, and I think today when people talk about divisiveness and issues, and we've got a lot of them today, but, you know, a little bit of a history yeah. lesson, it was a lot messier, yeah. a lot messier back then. And that was my senior year of college. Yeah. So it was as if we were being launched into this world that seemed to be disintegrating. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, Johnson saying he wasn't going to run again was a huge, an astonishing shock. And then just, what, four days later, Martin Luther King's assassinated. Mm -hmm. That was, that was such a blow. And it was followed by um, violence in the cities, uh, many cities across the nation of a sort Kent that- Kent State 1968? That was 70, 70. that was later. Okay. But the, the violence uh, in urban areas in Washington, D.C., people were fleeing the city, trying to get away from the violence. Yeah. Uh, and then right after my graduation, like a week after my graduation, Bobby Kennedy was shot. It just, yeah. it was unimaginable. And then the Democratic Convention that summer, again, rioting in the streets in Chicago. As serious rioting in the streets. Serious rioting yeah. in the streets. Yeah. So the place of violence in American life in in that year, and really urban riots throughout my college years. It seemed that the nation was in violent upheaval in a very frightening way. By the way, it was. It, I mean, was. it was. It was. It was. And, and especially when you have a perspective of thinking now, you know, much, 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 much more so than now. Mm -hmm. Much, much more mm -hmm. so than now. I kind of skipped over because I wanted to ask you about Bryn Mawr, which you talk about as a, you know, an intellectually stimulating place, but you also talk about limitations. You know, what was it like? You continued from Concord to another all girls school. You know, talk about Bryn Mawr and kind of your take. Your take so on I that. just want to establish a little fact here, which is uh, people have said to me, so why didn't you go to Princeton like your father and your brother? Because <laughs> Princeton didn't take women when I was going to college. So just remember that this is also not, I mean, here's a living person who was not able to apply to a whole bunch of schools that now, can't remember that they were exclusively male. And uh, if I had gone to Radcliffe, which was the women's part of Harvard, I wouldn't have been allowed in the undergraduate library. So there were women at Radcliffe as part of Harvard, but they had different access to different aspects of the university community. It's, it's well, just I, hard I, to remember. I chair the board of a small liberal arts college, not as prestigious as Princeton or, or, um, <laughs> or, uh, or Harvard, but... Um, that has completely forgotten that for, you know, it's, it's, it's been around for over 200 years, but it's completely forgotten that for most of those 200 years, it was all up men. to 1982, yeah. it, was, it was all yeah. men. Yeah. So I went off to Bryn Mawr College, which was, it still is, but it was even smaller then. It was tiny, 
but it had a reputation for being really intellectual. It had a tiny college with a graduate school of all things. And it was, again, this world of accomplished women, this time scholarly women who were doing research and had PhDs and were accomplished uh, writers and thinkers in their areas of study. And I think that was inspiring for me. And Bryn Mawr told us, you can do anything because you're just as good as, if not better than, any man. So we're going to ready you to compete with men and crush them, basically, was the, they didn't quite put it that way, but that was implicit. And yet I realized, and other members of my class also have talked about this in the years that have followed, there was never a sense of, we're going to change you to be able to change things for, things for women in general. Instead, it was, we're going to make you so good that when you go out into that, man, into that man's world, you'll win. And so it wasn't really a feminist message. It wasn't a change the world for women message. It was go out and take the world as it is and conquer it. And so for a lot of us, when we did graduate, we weren't ready for the hurdles we've been taken so seriously as undergraduates. We weren't ready for the realities of the world as it still existed around us, if that makes sense. Yeah. Talk about your first job. You went to work in government. So my first job was in government, and I went to work at the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which was then only a couple of years old. And I was very interested in cities because of all this upheaval in cities, and that seemed to me a place where um, we needed to improve American life. My professors and a lot of my friends in college thought, of course you'll go to law school. I knew I didn't want to go to law school. I knew if I went to graduate school, I wanted to study what I wanted to study, not torts or all the things you had to take to be a, a, a law student. But I did think I needed to get out of universities for a while and see what the real world looked like. So I worked at the Department of Housing and Urban Development for two years. And that sent me right back uh, to graduate school and in history. Mm -hmm. And I decided that universities were where I wanted to spend my life. And so it was a good, it was a good experiment. Yeah. I learned a lot. I became much less naive about how government works than I had been <laughs> when I started. I don't think I did much to improve American cities, but yeah. nevertheless. Yeah. In the epilogue of the book, you say, quote, freedom had been a pressing concern for me from the time I was a small child and first launched battles with my mother about clothes and hair and girls' rules. But freedom had become a great deal more than just not being treated differently than my brothers. Expand on that. As I was writing this book, I realized that there was a kind of theme that went throughout it about freedom. And for me, as David just quoted, it was, I want to be able to do everything my brothers can do. I want to be free from these constraints. Then I began to see the issues concerning race in America and the freedom struggle of the civil rights movement and the just enormous idealism of that, which with which I identified so strongly. Then I saw constrictions of freedom in East Germany, but an insistence on the part of our minder that East Germany was devoted to making sure there was freedom to as well as freedom from with healthcare and education and all the things that the state provided to enable people to be free to do things, not just have a notion of freedom that is removing chains. And so this, this meditation on what freedom meant was a part and parcel with so many things that I'd done uh, as, a young, as a young person. But when I graduated from college and towards the end of the, what I talk about at the end of the book is, I feel as if this book is in a way my escape from Virginia, metaphorically Virginia, <laughs> escape from what I had been intended to be. But then I had decided, what was I gonna use that freedom for? If I'd escaped from these constraints, my next challenge was gonna be, how was I gonna use that freedom? And what was I gonna devote it to? And what was I gonna try to make my life matter for? Mm -hmm. And that that's what, I, I kind of end the book with that question, yeah. unanswered as the book ends. I just want to ask you at a very high level, give us some of your perspectives on what's going on with higher education you know, broadly and what's going on in college campuses broadly 
and how you're thinking about all that? Well, it's been six years since I ended my presidency. So an awful lot has happened in the world since then. Earth shaking things, the pandemic, George mm -hmm. Floyd, all kinds of changes. And so I'm at best rusty on all of this, shall I say. <clears throat> and you as board chair probably are closer to the action at Hamilton College than, than I am now. But maybe that could be seen to give me some perspective. Mm -hmm. One of the aspects I would comment on is just how different colleges are now from when I was in college in ways that we have to recognize, make them complicated places. In 1970, which would have been two years after I graduated from college, among American adults over the age of 25, fewer than 10% had college degrees. In 2020, that number is close to 40%. So we have really expanded the inclusivity of American higher education. And that has meant an expansion of the diversity of American higher education and the potential for conflict and difference even as we hold up this ideal of talking across those differences, a noble, noble ideal, I think, that we should continue to strive for. But it's a tough one. And I particularly have thought about this in relationship to having been on campus at a time of war in my own youth and seeing campuses now in a time of war. At Bryn Mawr and Haverford Colleges, just about everybody was from the United States. No one was fighting on opposite sides, literally fighting on opposite sides of the war that was going on. We now have students whose relatives have been killed or kidnapped next to friends of the students from Ramallah who were shot in Vermont. And we're telling these people, sit down at the table together and eat dinner, share the bathroom, share a classroom, and argue about these ideas. That is a big That's order. Tough. Yeah. It's really tough. And so part of what I feel about higher education right now is we're asking a huge amount of ourselves. And if we just look about what's going on beyond the walls of universities, too, in this society, it's so divided. So that is, in part, what we're seeing reflected in college campus. On that note, Drew, thank you. Thank you for coming back thank and spending you. the time with us. Thank, thank you for being here. Thank you all for coming.